when when people come to us to get certain things done, I tell them how we are going to do it. They don't tell me how we're going to do it. And that includes what software we're going to use. So we, when we're, when we do certain things, we use this software. When we do other things, we use this software. And the client doesn't dictate that to us, we do. So if the client is dictating to you <clears throat> what software you're going to use because that's what they use, they're probably not an ideal client. So what I would do, what I would, what I recommend that for everybody is figure out what your not negotiables are and then don't negotiate it. If somebody comes to you and they're using software or tools that you don't want to work with or you're not familiar with and you don't want to learn, then they're not an ideal client for you. But if they come, to, if, if you get a bunch of people coming to you with the, with the same like app that they use connected to, their, to your preferred software, then I would definitely take a look at what, um, and if you do want to expand your knowledge base to include supporting that software, but really it is, you, you have to decide what software you're comfortable with and what software you want to use. And not only you, but as you grow and scale, what do you want your team to be responsible? Do you want your team to be responsible for knowing seven different types of, of software or one? And for, for a while, it was always like, oh, you know, however you, you know, whatever you've got, we'll work with, whatever. But that's not, you can't scale when, when your clients are dictating to you what, what, how you do your job, what tools you use to do your job. You know, um, Joe Woodard has a good example of if accountants owned a coffee shop, there'd be uh, shelves filled with different coffee makers because they would let the client say, no, I don't want you to use that. Well, I want you to use that coffee maker and I want you to use these beans, not those beans. Because accountants do that all the time and I don't think we always realize what, how big of an issue that it is until all of a sudden we're like, you lose control of your business because you are using so many different softwares and you can't scale. Um, so, and you know, the, the other thing is, you know, with, with pricing, I saw a story about some guy wanted to get his hit a deck built on his house and he got some quotes and then he negotiated then he tried to negotiate with the guy and the guy's like I'm I'm sorry but if you want you know we this this is our price and and, and stuff but if if that if you the price that you suggested I could teach you how to do it but you'll have to get your own lumber. You'll have, these are the, these are the tools that you're going to need. And then, you know, the, the guy's like, okay, let me think about it. And then he goes and he's like, well, the, the lumber is this, and then I have to buy all these tools. And then it's more than what I was going to pay you to do it. And the guy's like, all right, what option do you want? He's like, I'll just have you do it. And when, because people just look at, at things when we don't show them all the value of all of the things that we bring to the table, they, they don't see the value. A lot of times people treat accounting and, and everything just as data entry and as an expense, not an investment in their company. And we need to change that. We need to let people know what value we provide to them 
and they don't get as excited about beautiful reports as we do. Nobody does. And we're just weird that way. I think even some accountants don't get excited about beautiful reports anymore. But, um, you know, we, we have to, you know, provide, okay, so, you know, go to use a, that example of here's all the tools that you'll need to buy to do this job. Here's the education that you'll have to get. Here's, you know, give them, because people come to me all the time because we do offer um, ERC training. And if they don't, they, sometimes they don't want to pay, pay my price. And so I'm like, all right, here's all the different webinars that, that I went to. And here's, here's some free trainings, here's, some, here's the other trainings and, and everything else. And at this point in my career, if they just take the, the list of trainings that I give them and they don't come back, I don't worry about it too much just because of the fact that we have been able to become known as experts in our field. And sometimes, quite honestly, the best thing that you can do for prospects that, that think you're too expensive is to give them different tools and send them on their way. Because if you try to do what the prospect want that is way less than what you would charge for something normally and try to work with them and try to be nice and try to be helpful because we want to help everybody. We Sometimes the best help you can give somebody is the tools to do it on their own and give them the space and come back to you when they are ready to pay for for your professionalism. Um, because how many times, I'm guilty of it too, how many times do you try to negotiate with the client and say, okay, well, for, for the price that, for, for your price point, we can do these few things, but we won't do these other things. And then the client agrees to it. And then the next thing you know, they're mad because you're not doing the things that you said you couldn't do for the price that they were willing to pay. When you turn around and say, no, here, this, this is my fee. This is what I provide. And that is it. Your clients are, you get better clients when you stick to your guns. Did you? I don't know how it happens. It just happens. And when you fire a bad client that you know they're a bad client when either when you're doing your invoicing and you're sending out their bill and you get a pit in your stomach, when you cringe when you see a text message, an email, a phone call, or your a portal message from that client, you know you don't want to work with them. And I am super guilty of it. I had a client for five years and all she did was complain about my price. She was paying you guys, she was paying $60 a month for bookkeeping. And I went to her office. And she was complaining about paying $60 a month for bookkeeping. And then because I was in her office, she was always like, oh, can you do this? Can you do this? Next thing I know, I'm there for three hours and I'm making $60 a month. And it was supposed to be, I think, an hour and a half or two hours because I knew her. So and again, don't work with friends. Um, because a lot of times that that relationship it 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 can work out. I have I have done books for friends. I have done books for people who became friends, and it worked out. 
but um, anyway, um, so you have to be able to dictate your price, your software, what you're going to do for your price. And when you get rid of a bad client, all of a sudden you'll get like three new better clients that are gonna replace that one. And I, I don't know how it works, but every time I have fired a bad client, I have gotten at least three new prospects that were way better than the client that, that I got rid of. But it doesn't always happen if the client fires you, I have, I have found. If the client fires you or does really shady things to you, you it, when, when they leave, it's like they leave a gray cloud around you that doesn't let the good in. But when you get rid of the gray cloud, it, it lets light in. Um, I don't know. That's, that's like the best way that I can explain it. 